Okay, welcome everyone to uh, Poetry Sunday. We're on uh, Haiku Part 2 today. If you've not seen Haiku Part 1, I highly recommend it, where we clear away a lot of the common misconceptions about Haiku, kind of clear the boards. Also, we're using this superb book, the Haiku Anthology, edited by Cor van den Heuvel, and just you can get this through Amazon or wherever you get your books. You want this book. Okay, so uh, uh, several of you have been uh, uh, enjoying that book and picking out haikus you want to talk about. And uh, Lisa, you've got one for us? Yeah, I have one. If you have the book, it's on page 170. Mm -hmm. It's by Alexis Rotella. And it's the first one on the top of the page. She um, okay. And like Dean said, if you don't have the book, the haikus are so short and simple. Undressed. Today's role dangles from a metal hanger. <laughs> Undressed. Today's role dangles from a metal hanger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, boy, that's great. That is <laughs> that is great. Uh, good. I'm seeing smiles and hearing chuckles. What uh, uh, what what are people getting from this one? Um, first of first of all, I think it's 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 always good to start with these with okay, just on the most literal level, what is going on? Because usually uh, there's a strong sense of place, maybe maybe time, maybe you know who's who's in the cast of this particular haiku. Often just one person. Uh, so where are we? What's the what's the dramatic situation here? What's going on? Someone someone's waking up and starting the day, I guess, by looking in their closet to what they're going to put on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're undressed, and before they put it on, they sort of are aware that they're just there's something that they're going to be wearing that day. Yep. Mm -hmm. So. So yeah, so, that sounds right to everyone. Morning, morning haiku. To, to today's roll. It could be morning or evening. No, un undressed. Uh -huh. End of I'm the day. <laughs> oh, right. That's right. That's right. Right. It's undressed rather than not yet dressed. Yeah, it, it could, it could. It could work either way. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I saw it as nighttime, but I could see it as morning also. <laughs> yeah, because I had a sense that there was there was a role to be played, so that would be something suggesting the morning. Right, a role to be played or a role one has played. Now, right. this is actually this is a great question. This is this is, and rather than ask, what did who is it, Alexis Rotella? Mm -hmm. Yeah, rather rather than asking what which did she have in mind, let's ask ourselves which works better. Mm -hmm. If we were writing this, if this were our haiku, which would we want it to be? Which works better in the in the sense of what what uh, a good haiku does? Or or what different what? Let's start with before we get to a value judgment, what's the different, what's the difference in the, in the tone or the feeling, whether it's clothes you're about to put on or clothes you've taken off? Wow, well, if I think of that, um, if it's the clothes oh, I've, see. If, it's the, if it's the clothes I've taken off, then it's the role that I played that day. Yeah. If it's the clothes that, if it's the morning, you know, uh, what is the role that I think I need to play or that I want to play that day? I, yeah, yeah. It kind of and works both ways. Yeah, it, it does, but yeah, Judy? It says, today's role dangles. So right. it's already happened. Yeah, that could be implied. I mean, on the literal level, either way, the the, the the clothing yeah. is going to dangle from the from the the hanger, but yeah, that could that could be the implication. What comes after dangled? 
Dengel's uh, uh, present tense. Oh, but thank you, Bob, because you just reminded me of something I think I failed to say last week, which is that haiku are written in the present tense. Oh. Haiku are almost always, I think there's a few exceptions, but almost always written in the present tense. That changes. Can you read it again one more time, please? Yeah, yeah. undressed. Today's roll dangles from a metal hanger. That it makes it the morning for me. Dangles is is like it's it's waiting. It's it's enticing. It's waiting mm -hmm. to happen. Mm -hmm. Dangles, yeah, yeah. I, Maybe. I have to uh, say I, something. Oh, yeah, Dean, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Cynthia. I saw myself in my first apartment on 14th Street in New York City, <laughs> right. going to my first corporate job at Rockefeller Center and pretending that I was like a marketing professional, professional post art school. So yeah. this really, as soon as you read this, I, I just so related <laughs> to it. It was really, I, I really enjoyed it. Although I like the idea of um, in, in bringing up that this might've been past tense i like that too like i've taken it off and that's over for the day that's a really cool way to look at it but i saw it as the the day was waiting um, well whether whether this is taking place at the beginning of the day or the end of the day it would still be present tense we're, right we're exactly. still in the we're still in the situation where yeah. it dangles present tense to me part of the difference holding actually implies a part of world i'm sorry Barbara, talking? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was muted. Yeah, no. OK. Um, no, we want her. Keep going. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to mute Barbara. OK. <laughs> yeah, because she's okay. Um, on the other uh, side. Um, what's I going to say? Present tense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's present tense either way. Oh, OK. Yeah, and of course, haiku are written in present tense because they are about giving us a moment of experience. And ex all experience is in the present. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? We've all heard that, we've all said that, some of us have written it, written you know, it, it in books and so forth, but we have to keep reminding ourselves. We have to keep pointing that out to ourselves, mm. you know? Mm. You know, you know for, from a wonderful Buddhist teacher, Charles Genoux, I learned some exercises like, you know, we can do this, like, okay, please wave your fingers in front of your face. Let's all do this. Wave your fingers in front of your face. Okay, good. Now stop. Okay. Now do it three seconds in the past. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Good, good, good. Now do three <laughs> seconds in the future. <laughs> okay, now do it in the present. Okay, good. <laughs> and Bob, your laughter is, a, is an indication of the way we, the fact that we forget this. Yeah. Even though we know it in our heads, we forget it in our bones. And that's why it's good to connect with it with some bones, doing something physically, right? Mm. This is where all experience is, including when you think, oh yeah, but I can experience the past, what I, I can remember what I had for breakfast, first of all, the older you get, the more you realize how completely unreliable memory is. <laughs> and, and, so, and, 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 and as far as, as forecasting the future, that, that was always, you know, useless. <laughs> but, okay, your experience of me memory. Everyone remember what you had for breakfast this morning, if you can. All right. So now you're experiencing something called a memory. Is that memory made out of yogurt and granola? No, it's made out of thought. And when is that thought being experienced? Now. That's the, the right. So, so part of what haiku is about is cutting through, cutting through concepts. Kind of again, you know, they come from the background of Zen, and Zen, you know, like all powerful meditative or spiritual traditions cutting through concepts to actuality. We don't have to, we don't build up enlightenment. We just cut through bullshit and then what's left is actuality and actuality is enlightenment. You know? Mm. So, so present tense. Now, 
getting back to, to this one, just looking at the, you know, without making a value judgment, is this better in the morning or the evening? Um, traditional haiku, traditional Japanese haiku, I mentioned this last week, you generally have a, they're generally outdoors. They're generally in what we call nature. You know, modern haiku like this more, uh, very often are in, in, in a way have a bigger range. They're often indoors in more human situations, dealing as much with human nature as with what we usually call nature mm. and dealing with humor and sometimes with sexuality and, and relationship, you know, have a, a much wider range, um, which is great as long as you keep getting down to that nub of direct experience of actuality and particularly somehow that that experience of some a moment where where the facts on the ground where what's going on somehow open up into a moment of of what in zen they call kensho you know that, that moment of of the of the boundlessness the eternal uh shining through the specifics of the of the moment the momentary experience right now so usually in traditional haiku there's at least one word that it, that implies either states or implies the season. So you have spring haiku, summer haiku, fall haiku, winter haiku. And, and the, you know, the, the, they love them, the Japanese love them all. They're all loved. But if they had to pick one, what do you think is the favorite season for haiku? Spring. Spring is the second favorite. Fall. Oh. Fall is the favorite. I just I read so many of them. That... <laughs> right, right. Can you see why fall is the favorite? If fall is, 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 well, we, uh, uh, winter and summer are extremes. So they're a little bit less interesting. What's always more interesting is where you have nuance, gradation, subtlety, mm -hmm. right? And spring is very interesting and change. And you've got change. You've got the new blossoms coming out and so forth. But fall is uh, elegiac, right? Fall is, is tends to be melancholy. We've had the fullness of the harvest and the summer and the freedom of running around, you know, in our T-shirts and so forth. And now we're, that's starting to go away. There's a word... Um, Actually, this is a, a one word in Japanese that's very good to know to, to if we're when we're reading haiku, yugen, yugen, y u g e n, y u g e n, and it's essentially untranslatable, uh, but it means it, it it refers to a mood, something like w somewhere in the area of wistful, nostalgic elegiac and if you look it up you can find descriptions from from you know uh, uh, Zen writers and, and haiku writers where they'll say you know yugen is when you and they always make it concrete yugen is when you watch the wild geese flying over the horizon and watch them and watch them till they disappear and you keep watching or they'll say yugen is when you wander in the woods by yourself with no thought of where you're going or when you're coming back or, you know. So, so coming back to this haiku, I personally like this one if it's in the evening at the end of the day because it's more a sense of yugen. It's the evening is more like the, the fall, more like the autumn. And we've been through the activity of the day and then, you know, we get back to the to, to something more like the, the fundamental truth of ourself, undressed. And we happen to look over and there's, oh, I did that today, you know. I taught school all day. I was Mr. Slider. <laughs> I wore that necktie. I didn't really wear the necktie. <laughs> I did for a couple of years, then I refused. But, you know, oh, I was a policeman. I was this, I was that. And, of course, we're not any of that. Right? These are roles that we wear and all the rest. We were not a policeman. We're not a teacher. We are, right, we're a person playing that role. 
And we're actually not even a person. We're really being that, you know, deeper. We're beingness, we're awareness, we're boundlessness, playing the role now of a human, maybe before playing the role of a horse or a rock or something. Which just, when you mention it that way, just that word undressed, you know, it's like free of all of the ways that yes. I identify. You know? Yes, undressed, <laughs> revealed, revealed. Yeah, I, I, I like that. See, and again, that's why I vote for this as an evening haiku, because haiku are about revelation of, of, of samadhi, revelation of, of Kensho, right? They're about getting undressed undressing ourselves from all our concepts of who we thought we were and what we thought we were, and then what's left. The, the naked truth of our, <laughs> of our beingness, right? They, in, in Tibetan teaching, that, that phrase is actually used a lot, naked awareness mm -hmm. or bare awareness. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes, that's, sometimes that's how the meditation instruction is given. They say, just sit in bare awareness. Actually, people often sometimes misunderstand that. They think, okay, I'll just be barely aware. But that's not what it means. It's just, just be aware and realize that that's all you are. Everything else, anything else that's there is just something you're aware of. It's something passing through the awareness. It's, it's kind of an interesting dichotomy to go from something that naked to something mm -hmm. as concrete as a metal hanger. He didn't say a wood hanger, a plastic oh, hanger, yeah. it's a metal hanger. Yeah. The, the just a position is just kind of interesting. Yeah. That's probably because he had metal hangers, right? Or she. <laughs> I'm just wondering, I don't, I don't no, know if that's no, just- No, 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 Bob, no, Bob, no, Bob. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Speak. That's my literalism. <laughs> yes, okay, well- Anyway. Okay, speak, speaking as someone who tries to function as a writer sometime, let me tell you, there's a lot of lying involved. <laughs> you, you don't write about what is, you, you write about what, what should be, right? You find what works, what works, right? First of all, but you're very right to point out that they specified. They made it, whether they made it metal or they made it wood, it's important that they made it something because that makes it concrete. We have to have the concrete, the concreteness, the specificity of the moment mm -hmm. as the launching pad. We have to have specificity as the launching pad into universality, mm. right? And the, and the more specific, the more we have, you know, the whole thing comes down in Buddhist terms into the, uh, uh, the Pranyaparamita Hridaya Sutra, right? Form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form, right? Form is exactly emptiness, emptiness exactly form, right? So form and emptiness are not opposed. They, and and that, in a sense, that's what haiku is about. It's, let me make the form as specific, as form-like as possible as it explodes into the experience of, of emptiness, right, which is, the same as naked awareness, bare awareness, empty beingness. And I love it's today's role, right? Tomorrow I'll be something else, yeah. right? It's all, it's all, it's yeah. all passing. It's all ephemeral. Yeah. Good. Who's got another one for us? I have one. Yes, Page please. 108. How appropriate. <laughs> um, moonlit sleet in the holes of my harmonica. <laughs> okay, Cynthia, uh -huh. read, right, read it again. I, I mentioned last week, you always read it twice. And also, there's a little bit of art to reading these, which is we want to hear the wholeness of the thing. It's because it's portraying one moment. But there is a reason for the three line structure. The three line structure is never arbitrary. So you want to read it in such a way that we can also hear the three lines. Okay, okay. go. Moonlit sleet in the holes of my harmonica. <laughs> okay, what's going on? 
What's going on? Yeah, it is. It's funny. What's going on? Why do you why do you like this one, Cynthia? Why why did you read this? I think because it's so evocative, and um, for me, it was sort of a complete visual in, in the in a second um, of seeing someone playing his guitar. I mean, his harmonica, and on a dark night in a city. Mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the winter with the sleet coming down. Uh -huh. so it, it was, and it was also, um, it's fewer words than many of them though, certainly 17 syllables. So uh -huh. I thought it was very interesting how, um, how complete the image was uh -huh. so quickly. Would you read it once more? Please. And, and, by, and by the way, since we're since I'm going to be slapping this this video up on YouTube, I always I want to give credit for these. So this is by David Lloyd. Right. Good. OK, uh, moonlit sleet in the holes of my harmonica. OK, Sorry, best on harmonica. <laughs> OK, so, so what what else is anyone getting about the, the basic situation here, the dramatic situation? What's going on? Just in terms of what's what's going on. I mean, you indicated, Cynthia. Okay, here's someone playing their their harmonic. It's nighttime. The moon is out. It's winter, right? Sleet. It's cold. Uh, what are they doing there? Why are you playing a harmonica? And <laughs> and you indicated a city street, which it doesn't say, but that's fine. That's that's what you were getting from it. It seemed to be evoking that. Um, well, what, in, what, what's the person doing there? Street musicians often claim particular areas of streets or corners in cities, and they are they're claimed and they belong to them. So sometimes, um, not only is this person alone with his harmonica, but other people are participating because they're passing. Uh -huh. So, um, and it's. It's almost like experiencing musicians in um, in a city through the seasons. Mm -hmm. And um, I think when I was young and, and I lived in a city, a friend said, never pass a street musician without giving them money. Mm -hmm. And I never ever did after that. You know, I, I, I never, you know, neglected to give them something. So this, I-, I um, Unless they're really bad and you don't want to encourage them. <laughs> you don't encourage them. Yeah. Well, I mean, often they're good, you know, yeah. mostly yeah. they're good. Um, so anyway, that's what I felt about yeah. it. So, so this is a busker, right? This is a street musician in the, in the city. Um, yeah. What else from anyone? Well, it's, it's, it's so interesting how a piece of art can, can create such a different impress and impression. You know, there's, the intention or the gestalt of the poet and then there's the poem and then there's the person reading it so uh -huh. mine was so cynthia different so fascinating i that those first two words moonlit sleet were so strange because sleet to me is you know a sheet of water or something so this you know moonlit sleet was this kind of aura of moonlight that was filtering into the holes of his harmonicas. I had a sense of being alone underneath a full moon and that it was just a, a incredibly intimate moment as moving in. I, I, I didn't even have a sense that he was playing, that the moonlight was going into the holes of the harmonica. Well, and the, sleet, the, the, sleet, of the sleet has gone so. into the holes. Right. Yes. So right. moonlit sleet. <laughs> what an image. Yeah. Speaking, speaking as someone who who has at certain points of his life played harmonica and actually played it on the street. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that if you're actively playing, you're not going to get any sleet in there because it's in your mouth, which is warm. Yeah. So this indicates to me it's someone who's sitting there, he's not playing, probably does not have other musicians around him. It sounds lonely. It's cold. You don't want to be out on that street when it's in the sleet. 
it, it, right? And also, by the way, notice the repetition of the sounds, moonlit sleep, the L, the mm. L, T and the L T and how that kind of unifies the moonlight and the sleet, mm. right? So, so to me, this is a moment where you, you look down at this harmonic you've been clutching in your hands and you go, Oh my God, I've been sitting here in this, in this crappy weather so long that my harmonica is starting to fill with it. It's that's not, that's not good for the, for the harp. Then your reeds start to get rusty and so forth. So I'm seeing this as a street musician who's got nowhere to go. <laughs> you know, he's, he was hoping to, hoping to make 50 cents so he can go in an all night diner and get a cup of coffee or something. But why would you even assume that it's a street musician? Um, well, it's, it, it's, it's someone who's out. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm just, I mean, it's someone who, to me, it's someone who doesn't want, I hate the cold. So, you know, it's someone who doesn't want to be out there in the, you, no one wants to be out in the sleep. Right. But, but, but he has the harmonica because he's, you know, maybe a street musician or maybe actually hearkening back to my own past, you know, in my hippie days, I used to hitchhike across the country. I used to hitchhike around the country. And w when I wasn't getting a ride, I would sit there and play the harmonica. Later, I became a, I became a school teacher and I, I, every once in a while I'd do something on the harmonica and, and, and my students would ask, wow, and I'd you know, play some blues or something. They'd say, wow, how do you learn to do that? I'd say, put a harmonica in your pocket and hitchhike across the country. <laughs> <laughs> Their mothers loved you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. These were, these were rich kids. They needed to have some some uh, all, all, some all, some alternatives presented to them. Um, uh, so yeah, it could you could be at some lonely some lonely country road, hoping hoping another pickup truck is going to come and pick you up, something like that. But th where is the moment? So there's plenty of yugen here. There's plenty of melancholy. There's plenty of silence and solitude. Where does it light up into Samadhi? The holes. Yeah, the holes, there's a peering within. There's a suddenly, oh, look closer. Look closer. You know, in the previous one, the revelation was, oh, undress. Right? You see how one way or another, the universality comes out of the specificity. So it, where's, where does the revelation, the epiphany come from? Undress. Here it comes from look into the holes, look into the dark place, the dark interior. But what do you find there? <laughs> moonlight. Mm. The, sl the sleet is moonlit. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's incredibly beautiful. That's when, especially you're there, you're cold, you're hungry, you're lonely. And then here's this crazy thing. The moon is, and this is a saying, you know, in, in Buddhist teachings that the, the, the sun or the moon shines it shines on the ocean it shines on the lake it shines in the in the in the teacup right and that's the symbol of the the wholeness of life the 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 the, the infinite the the brahman the Tao, the buddha nature the kingdom of heaven the universal again shines in all the biggest and all the smallest you know uh, uh, parcels of the finite in the most intimate places and, and again, that's what's incredible it's fi in this haiku. It's finding this in this, this very intimate place. Okay, who else has got one for us? I got a, I got a bunch. <laughs> I tried to get a book, but I haven't been successful yet. <laughs> Okay, okay, Judy, you, you let me know during the week if you continue to have a problem with that. I'll, I'll see what I can do. Okay, this one's on page 49 by Gary Gay. No, 48 by Gary Gay. Weightlifter slowly lifting the teacup. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's hilarious. <laughs> Weightlifter 
slowly lifting the teacup. <laughs> well, it points out that we all assume that any anyone that's being called a weightlifter, it has to be heavy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, right. Anything else that we might as tend to assume about someone called a weightlifter? Right. He's a bit of a brute. Maybe a brute. <laughs> I mean, that's not fair. That's for that's, that's no, yeah, yeah, no, but this this is exactly <laughs> what we're asking about. I'm not I'm not saying our 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 biases valid. I'm just asking what are our biases? Mm -hmm. Right? We think the weightlifter, what, what would we expect him to be drinking if we're going by our biases? A beer. Beer. <laughs> Yeah. Protein yeah. drink. Yeah, he's he's hoisting a big, you know, pint. Bug. Right. Right. But he's lifting he's lifting a teacup. I I'm I'm I, I like to think his his he's got his pinky is <laughs> right. like he's drinking tea with the queen. But also the fact that he says slowly lifting. Yes. There's such a an introspective a uh, slow down moment happening here for this mighty weight lift, weight weightlifter. <laughs> yes, we imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of uh, course, the, and of course, the jokey part is that he's lift. In a sense, he's lifting it the way he would lift some very heavy weight, slowly. You know, like it's this big exertion, and here with the same slowness, lifting this delicate teacup. Right. I hope you're all like me seeing it as a delicate china teacup. Well, I think oh, yeah. that's what's interesting about he doesn't say a teacup, he says the teacup. Ah, thank you. <laughs> no. Thank thank you for pointing this is another thing I failed to point out last I didn't, night. Uh, I didn't, that, didn't. Yeah, sis uh, uh Judy, that that it's not a teacup, it's the teacup. Oh the, the. Teacup. so this is something else I failed to point out before which is that if, if you read through these, you'll notice that haiku f uh, favor um, the um, uh, uh, definite articles rather than indefinite articles. Basically, that means you say the rather than a. Mm -hmm. The <laughs> rather than a. Why? Why? If you, this is something subtle, but if you get this, you've, you've gotten a lot. What's the difference between saying the teacup or a teacup. A a teacup. Yeah, 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 Judy, Judy. It's just one. It's, it's, just, it's right yeah. there. It's, right it's, there. The. It's right there. It's specific. But I'll if we say, be wide open. Yeah, but if we say uh, it's it's also still one. It's also still singular. That's yes, wrong. but it could be any of them. But the makes it a definite one. Yeah, to say, uh, as, you, as you say, Judy, it could be any of them. Excuse me one second. Could, could you uh, plug this in for me, please? Yeah. yeah. Um, if you say, uh, it implies the possibility of others, right? It's like one out of uh, many possible, right? It's, 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 it's like, uh, whereas to say, the, it's as if we already know what teacup we're talking about. It's the teacup. It's the, it's the, it's in this moment, it's the one and only teacup. In other words, we're already in the moment. I am in the moment. Yes. <laughs> My teacup. Dude, it's not very delicate, but. <laughs> am, y'all. Um, yeah, we're, we're all, if we say the, we're already in the moment. It's the only teacup in the focus of our experience because there's only ever the teacup. We never, uh, has some feeling of like, like generic, like theoretical, mm -hmm. right? A teacup could be theoretically, uh, you know, it's like, let's say we take a teacup. No, no, we take the teacup. It's, it's more grounded. It's more, it's more solid. It's more real. I also get the, the sensation that it is his own teacup and, and, and the act of drinking it, he's not just lifting it like he would lift oh, one of his weights. He is lifting it and slowly. bringing it out very slowly. 
Yeah. Very deliberate. There's water in it. He doesn't want to spill it. Yeah, there's tea. Yes, yeah, he doesn't want to spill the tea because it's precious and because I, 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 and something I think I think you're kind of putting your finger on here, Lily, on it, which is, you know, he lifts the weight slowly. He also lifts the teacup slowly, but for different reasons, different yeah. situation, that, right? That's... From the outside, right? We can't feel the weight of the barbell. We can't feel the weight of the teacup. We only see something from the outside. We see this person do, and we'd say, oh, he's doing the same thing. But if we're in his skin, we see, oh, one way he's grunting and right doing, and the other way, oh, he's having his contemplative moment of tea. And of course, tea, you know, is very much the tea ceremony and all that is, you know, very much connected with the whole, the, the Zen cultural uh, uh, um, the context of, of haiku. You know, there's a whole business where preparing the tea and, and all that, every step of it is, a, is really a, a meditation. So also, very often you'll find in haiku very, that there's very deliberately, there's a contrast. There's something very big, something very small, or something, um, you know, loud and something quiet, some, something like that. In, or in order to give us a sense of kind of the, the range of experience, you know, and, and, and because then uh, what, what, you know, what's covered, what, what the, the infinite then covers everything between the extremes, right? Here's one more, and then actually, then, then we're going to be done here, I think. It's on page 65, page 65 by Lorraine Ellis Haar. After the snowfall, deep in the pine forest, the sound of an axe. All right. And notice if, if you've got the book in front of you, the ellipsis at, at the end of the first line. You know, when we're reading this, we, we want to convey the feeling of usually often there'll be an ellipsis, sometimes a dash, sometimes a colon. But generally, it's, it's, it's always going to set off the first line or the third line from the other two. And that's an important um, um, a, a, a beat, an important, you know, in music, the rests are as important as the notes. So that's an important rest. And each one, note, an ellipsis, dot, 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 has a different feeling from a dash and a different feeling from a colon. A colon is kind of, okay, here's one, here's the thing, and then dive into the other thing. Dash is like a, a like a sudden left turn. Whereas the ellipsis dot, dot, dot is like a trailing off. After the snow, what came next? Yeah, okay. After the snowfall, dot, 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 deep in the pine forest, the sound of an ax. So what's going on here? Right, it's winter. What else? What's going on in the sky? It's after the snowfall. Yeah. So, so the sky may be gray or it may be blue. We're not, we're not yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm seeing it as clear. I'm seeing sunlight glistening on all this new snow. Beautiful, pure snow. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, pure snow. It's untrodden because we're, it's right after the snowfall. The snowfall would would make it even more quiet a forest because yes, quiet to begin with, but it's even more quiet. Even more quiet. Everything is muffled by this blanket of of, of beautiful, pristine snow. And then deep in the pine forest, right? As soon as we hear that word deep, again, something, the interior of something, like peering into the holes in the harmonica, right? Deep in the pine forest, right? Which is not where the observer is, right? It's, it's deep in the forest relative to where the poet or the observer is. So, so that's somewhere. It's, and also, by the way, notice what's going on with the 
the colors here. We've got two two colors here: white. And, well, three colors: white, blue, green, and all washed in in sunlight. Deep in the pine forest, the sound of an axe. There's there's something so simple and virginal about the snowfall and something and white and something so definitive and I'm gonna I'm gonna say destructive about the sound of an axe because I live in Oregon and we see this clear cut and it's just right you know so that that's a the contrast is pretty phenomenal yeah so there's there's the contrast we were just talking about there's the principle of contrast um, does it seem as if this scene is, is you know, is a, is a scene of, of, you know, industrialized clear cut? No. No, it really, this is like, this is like the old days. This is, this is, this is somewhere where it's okay. You can go in there, cut something down, bring it back to, for your, your wood stove for your- Christmas. <laughs> That's true, to heat your home. To heat your home, yeah, yeah. But can you see how the, the contrast is such that you have the, the silence and the broad expanse of the snow, you know, going out and out, covering the whole landscape and the silence going out and out and out. And then the one, the, and really the moment in, of this haiku is just the single stroke of the ax, right? And then reverberating through the forest and how, in a sense, the, the sound, what we could call the, con the interruption or the contrast with the silence, mm. makes the experience of the silence deeper. Makes the experience of the silence deeper. And that brings us, really, this one is a descendant. In a sense, th there's one haiku that all haikus are descendants of because it was the first one ever written by the, the, the great patriarch of, of Japanese haiku, haiku Basho, Basho uh, who traveled all over, you know, by foot all over Japan, you know, hanging out in the, by the, the lakes and the forests and all that. And, and, you know, the way you would paint pictures of things, he would, he would make haikus of, of what he saw. And, and he started with actually an older poetic form that was more than three lines and he was the innovator who went no what if we drop off those last few lines and just just tighten it up to these three lines so he he invented uh, haiku and his very first haiku was and you'll you'll see it translated different ways it's it's a little bit hard to translate and you'll see why but it's something like this um, the old pond uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, the old well, frog jumps in, kerplop. Right? The old well, frog jumps in, kerplop. <laughs> All right. You see what's going on? You see how similar it is to this one? The old well, that's, that, there's, the, there's the emptiness, there's the, there's the, the boundlessness. There is awareness, right? And it's old, it's ancient, it's older than time. It's always been here, it will always be here. But if we want to experience it, if we, we, we need to enliven the experience somehow. Something lively, something new, something fresh has to jump in there. And then we can get the kerplop, which is like the plums the depths of the well. Gives us an experience of it through, through one of the senses. So that's so in a sense that's what that's what all of haiku is trying to do, and in a sense that's what all the arts are trying to do. Haiku does it in a very direct way, right? Very stripped down, minimalistic. You can't you can't fake it, right? You, and you can't get you can't get lost in other stuff. That's what I do. Right. Right. 
Okay. So, okay. So let's do more of this next week, shall we? Yes. Wait, it's way too way too much fun to not keep doing this. Okay. So, thank you all, and may the may the frog of life kerplop into your well, moment <laughs> after moment after moment. Please God. Please thank God. You. <laughs> Enjoy being. Thanks, Dean. Good.